Bottomless Menace. The next morning dawned cool and clear, a wash in light, and in it an angel sang. A breeze whispered through Oscar's window screen. Squirrels skittered along backyard branches. The sun floated in the sky like a tangerine bubble. One white cloud drifted near the horizon, slowly molding itself into different shapes, but never quite taking the form of anything Oscar recognized. And all across Mount, East Mount Edna, citizens awoke to a new day, a day of pride and promise, because for the first time in history, the East Mount Edna Wildcats had stomped the sawdust out of the West Mount Edna Yankees. Dr. Soul was nowhere to be seen. Oscar figured he must have gotten up early. He did that sometimes. Once Oscar awoke all the way, the angel's voice turned out to be his mother's, emanating from the kitchen along with the aroma of pancakes. He slipped out of bed and padded toward the hall, glancing out his window on the way. He froze in the bright morning light. There seemed to be a baseball player standing in Oscar's backyard at the shady edge of Tuscarora Woods. A bit ghostly, a bit shimmery, Oscar recognized him. He was the one who'd stolen Oscar's imaginary home run the night before. He still sported the uniform of the long gone Boston Braves. Oscar stared. The brave stared back. Then he stepped into the shadows and vanished. And Oscar blinked and told himself this ghostly ball player must have been left over from a dream that hadn't quite ended before he woke up. In the kitchen, Oscar's mom clattered so many utensils together at once, it sounded like a kinder music jam session. What's going on? Oscar asked. Why are we having pancakes? How come you're so vivacious? You, you hit a home run, said his mom. You're a bona fide bottomless menace. Deep threat, mom, said Oscar, not bottomless menace. When you're a dangerous home run hitter, People call you a deep threat, but I appreciate the pancakes. Why didn't you tell me about it last night? Asked his mother. Well, I told you about the part where the wildcats won, mumbled Oscar. That's what really matters. If you say so, replied his mom, have a look at this. She cued a video and slid her phone across the table. Oscar took the phone, ninth inning hero read the tagline beneath a still of his own face. In the image, he teetered precariously over home plate and peered hopefully into the future. You're going viral, Oscar, exclaimed his mother. Isn't it great? Somebody filmed it on their phone, croaked Oscar. Wow, that is great. It was awful. People across town, across the country, state, country, and world were at that very moment watching what he'd done the night before. For the love of Henry Aaron, his mom started the video. A boy, a dream, a moment in history, a very long shot. The voice sounded familiar. An injured star, a last minute substitution, a bench warmer's dream come true. The voice sounded very familiar. Undaunted by a lifetime of obscurity, frustration, and failure, Oscar Indigo of East Mount Edna, Pennsylvania, overcame years of disappointment tonight. That was a little harsh, muttered Oscar. Had he really been that bad? Despite a fundamental lack of the basic skills of baseball, Oscar Indigo finally found success at 9.13 p.m. yesterday. As the narrator spoke, Oscar's at-bat video played on video. Tasers blew two pitches by him. He didn't seem to have a chance. And then came the final pitch. Right over the plate, the video seemed to stutter and skip. Suddenly, the ball was dropping over the fence and the crowd went wild. When he sent the hopes and dreams of his teammates sailing upward into the blackest of nights, Susie Armando's face appeared on the screen, smiling to her audience to close the sequence. 
Wait, muttered Oscar. That can't be right. Susie Armando of CSPN? I only imagined she was there last night. What's going on? Maybe somebody sent her the video of your home run and she liked it enough to do a story on it, said Oscar's mom. Maybe, said Oscar. He really hoped this explained it because otherwise things had just gotten really, really weird. Outside, a flock of towhees swarmed from a bush. Hey, I'm applying to Rossini's, said his mom. Your heroics inspired me. I downloaded the application. I'm filling it out tonight after work. I think summertime will be my audition tune. Fantastic, Mom, said Arthur, Oscar distractedly. I'm glad I inspired you. You sure did a home run. Oscar's mother made her way to the table with three pancakes on a stainless steel spatula and he moved his plate so she could reach it. But at that moment, she tried to slide the pancakes off the spatula where the plate had been. So he scooted the plate back, but by then she'd aimed at the spot where he'd moved the plate before he moved it back. And their intentions were good, but their timing was bad, and Oscar's pancakes plopped onto the floor. What a disaster, observed his mom cheerfully. Better clean it up. Oh my goodness, she cried, glancing out the window. Here comes the bus. I have to catch it. The Corolla's battery is dead. I need to buy a new one when I get paid this afternoon. See you tonight. And with that, she banged out the door. Bye, Mom, replied Oscar quietly. Oscar watched his mom through the window, sprinting to beat the bus to its stop. And then out of nowhere, the floor of the kitchen seemed to turn fluid and its surface seemed to roll away from him in waves. He blinked. He felt dizzy. The roar of the bus outside didn't match the sight of it pulling away from the stop, and inside the fluttering shadows on the floor didn't match the drifting curtains in the windows. When he stacked his glass and silverware on his plate to carry it all to the dishwasher, he picked the pile up before it was balanced, and everything slid in different directions. He made a grab for the glass, but he felt like he'd fallen into a YouTube video that hadn't lo loaded right, where every moment had gone herky-jerky. The glass fell one direction, the silverware another, and it all ended up on the floor, some of it in shards. The flock of towhees whirred past the window again, this time headed in the other direction, except for one which fluttered backwards across the yard, only disappearing into the woods after approximately 19 seconds of reverse flying. That, said Oscar to himself, cannot be good. As soon as he'd cleaned up the mess, Oscar fished the watch from his pajama pocket and contemplated its face, huge and pearlescent, with the solid gold hour and minute hands the bright red sweep hand, and the bold black numbers painted around the dial. He flipped it over and studied the swirling patterns adorning the back and saw words he hadn't seen before. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. Curiouser and curiouser, Oscar thought, and put the watch in his pocket. He stood up. He knew the time had come to walk next door and ask Miss Ellington what the heck was up with this watch. But before he could take a single step, a pounding erupted at his front door. His heart beat in his throat. Those men, the ones in the black car, they must have found him. They'd come for him. Frantically, Oscar opened his mother's bread box and slid the watch inside a hamburger bun, but not before another phrase leaped out at him from its back. Time is out of joint. That seemed like a warning. The pounding on the door continued. Carefully, Oscar crept down his hallway and peeked through the tiny peephole and spied Florida's mangy bat. Oscar, she yelled, are you in there? Oscar was shocked. This was more than she'd said to him in the entire time he'd known her.